It's Monday, October 10th, 2011. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, I was going to be, I was sitting there thinking like you have no idea what you're going to say for the title of the show. Let's do this. Yeah, I had no idea what I was going to call this episode. And, you know, normally I can just say something. It's like tonight we're talking about ducks, but... There was no one word to say what we're talking about. Brack. <laughs> Should we do a show on ducks? I don't know anything about ducks except that they are tasty. Well, you never had a pet duck? No. Really? You didn't either. Uh, yes, actually, I did. An actual duck. An actual duck for a while. How was it? Your, how did you take care of it? It was a rescue duck, and we raised him, and then when he was old enough, Did we, you have a pond for it to live in? We had a kiddie pool. You left the duck in the kiddie pool. There's a little duck, and he walked around. It didn't fly away. No, he walked around the garage and he pecked it. Didn't, didn't he need a big duck to follow around? A little duck train. <laughs> no, Did you have wooden ducks on a string to teach it to fl- to walk around? <laughs> now I'm just thinking about that XKCD where they make the uh, circle of ducks. Yep. But anyway, I digress. So we were in Manhattan over the weekend. It's ha- not that far. Having a party. I'm in Manhattan almost every weekend. Yeah. But we were having a party in Central Park, kind of a picnic, because it was... It was not a party. It was a party picnic. Sure. What, you, you wouldn't call that a party? Bunch of friends hanging out, drinking wine? No. Playing uh, the hive with random kids? That's not a party. Oh, it's a party. It has to have partying. So, standing around listening to that one really lame song? Or a cake. Or a cake. A cake would, would work. Well, you had strawberries. It's not a cake. And we had some uh, cake pastries from a Korean deli. Those aren't wearing cakes. Or Korean bakery. They were not cakes. Anyway. But we're there hanging out, and I'm climbing rocks, and we're doing all this stuff. And then uh, words start appearing in the sky. At first, we appeared. Oh, uh, O-U-I, as oui, in... We. That oui, is oui. correct, madame. Yes. And then a bunch of other stuff. And it's amazing, because in New York, pretty much... Well, Nothing. I think before the we we only noticed when the we appeared, but when we looked up at the we, there was an ST over to the side. So it was We're like Saint We, Street We, Stewie, Saint Louis. Stewie? Maybe the L and the S are coming in. Yeah, and it was weird because in New York, people don't react to things usually. Like a gun could go off, and most people just keep walking because they got somewhere to be. Fire trucks going by. There's some jackass jaywalking in front of it. Yep, but yet. In Central Park, there were thousands of people just looking up at the sky because what's that? What's it say? I don't know. Well, they weren't, you know, we're hanging out in the park. It's not like you're doing anything or in a rush to go anywhere. You're just laying down in the grass. Yeah. So you look up in the sky riding. It's like, oh, I wonder what that's going to say. So uh, we kept trying to watch it for a while and a bunch of words appeared. It didn't really make any sense. Yeah, I think at the end it like said St. We Lease or Our Lease. Yeah. So, uh... Today, I went on Google, and I was like, all right, Google News, tell me what I was up with skyriding over Yeah, how come they Manhattan? allow skyriding over Manhattan? Wouldn't that, isn't that FAA like, coming after that plane? Maybe they got a permit. Maybe. Maybe I figured out what happened. Is that an easy permit to get? I don't know. I want to draw 8 equals 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 D. Sure. So I go to Google News, right? Mm-hmm. And I type skyriding Manhattan. You know what the first headline is? What? Jittery New Yorkers fear skyriding terrorists. Great. Next one, skyriding in New York causes confusion. Every article about the skyriding makes a mention of 9-11. I'm sure that the skyrider was, you know, going to drop bombs from his tiny skyriding plane. Well, apparently he wrote many messages. One of them was, lost our lease. Oh. One of them was, now open. Uh Uh-huh. One of them was, last chance. Mm Mm-hmm. And supposedly, people who saw the last chance one... Got scared. Uh huh. But it bothers me that every single article about. But this who is now open? Who lost their lease? And it's the last chance. I'll get to that. What? But the fact that every article about this thing brought up 9/11 as though they're in any way related. But at the same time, I didn't see any citations of actual people bringing it up. It was news people saying some people were reminded of 9-11. Some people were afraid that it was a warning. Some people. I don't think there were any people. But they didn't have any actual people who thought that. I I think it was just, you know, some people is code in the news for I made some shit up. Mm. Or my personal opinion is, (laughs) oh, oh, no, God damn it. Here's a person. Uh, oh, well. Uh, I was genuinely there's scared. There's always going to be, yeah, there's always going to be Said a Morgan, person. 29, an Upper West Side actress. Yeah, okay. Okay. I was really concerned there was some sort of terrorist attack. It's so creepy. Sure. 
Whatever. So anyway, you know what this was? What? Art project. Oh, nice. They were writing lines from billboards that were in some way evocative of or related to the economic problems we're facing right now. Nice. Lost our lease. Mm -hmm. And then the last message was now open saying, you know what? We'll eventually open back up. Everything will be okay in the long run. Sure. So it was just a kind of lame art project. And they were, but you're allowed to do that? I guess. Dude, how much does it cost? I don't know. We should write something actual. Like what? You well, first get, of all, we got to point out one thing. You, we could not read Lost Our Lease due to how quickly the letters dissipate. But so, that's what I'm saying. You got to wait for the exact right weather. You know? And you got to have a very succinct message like 8 equals equals D. Exactly. I think our message should be frontrowcrew.com. Maybe. Be <laughs> <laughs> How's ponies. that for a good message? How about just hash ponies? <laughs> <laughs> How about they draw a rainbow dash, an outline of rainbow dash, or just they draw a cloud with lightning coming out of it? I would actually like to see And then they, just they can do the colored smoke. The jets do it. The thing is, this sort of art, like it's a neat art project, but... I don't know. I don't feel like it's really that original art. Like, all right, the idea is cool. Taking these slogans that are related to the economic crisis in some way, gathered in some artsy way. But why skywrite them? Like, that was kind of just, that was like the equivalent of going to the gallery where if you a guy put your art covered in, a, in jelly, surrounded by broken glass. If you put your art in a gallery, ten hipsters will come see it. If you put it in the sky, ten thousand people, people in Central Park will look at it. A million people will complain about how they didn't understand it. Yeah, but it's better than not seeing it at all. I doubt that the majority of people will ever know it was an art project because you didn't even think to look it up. I did think to look it up, but then I just didn't before I forgot and stopped <laughs> caring. And you know what? Now, now that I know, I still don't care. See, now it would be a better art project if I drew, say, the word fuck. Fuck yeah. Because then, free speech. And it would really, it would definitely get more attention in, a, in the right kind of way. I can imagine because the FUC would be up there and everyone in the street would be thinking the same thing. They're not actually writing fuck, but I hope they write fuck. I and should then hire when it was a actually fuck, people would lose their shit. I should hire a skywriter to go to Philly and skywrite like Philly suck or Eagle suck. <laughs> You're like Eagles. They're like, woo! You're like, suck. They're like, wait a minute. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Suck. <laughs> and a big ex big ass exclamation point at the end. Or maybe even write Eagle suck dick. <laughs> Get the extra word in there. How much does it cost per letter? I have no idea. <laughs> so, in the news, you all know that Netflix decided to launch possibly the most stupidly named company the world has ever seen. Regardless of the dumb name, right? I don't believe that dumb names are harmful in the long run. Look at the Wii. Okay. The Wii wasn't that dumb of a name because... Uh, whatever. Because it got people talking. Nobody... I mean, remember, when they announced the name of the console, nobody would shut up about that for like a month. And now people don't even think about it anymore. Yeah, because the Wii made so much money that they, they Except was Except they're fine. coming out with a blue Wii now, and Sonic is on the box. All I got to say is if, if your if Wii you is a, blue, if your Wii is you should blue, go to the doctor. See, a doctor right? see? We can still make the jokes. Anyway. We would not even, even be talking about the Wii now. My Wii is red, but at least that's... <laughs> Mine's flesh-colored. <laughs> sure. Slightly red if I overuse it. Mine's very red. Anyway. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> but seriously, Quickster... Who, no human could think that was a good idea. That's the kind of name that you use for if a they startup in 1991. If they would have going to whatever, fail. if they would have just gone through with it, people would have forgotten about the name thing in like a you know a few months. The big problem was they by if they had gone through with it, they would have split Netflix into two, and people just want less things. Oh, Scott, people, the same way you want less boxes under your TV, you want less bills, less accounts with less different less companies. See, Scott, my 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 point is that naming it Quickster means that even the people who want the DVD would probably not remember the name Quickster because they would they would think oh that's some old pirating thing. No, there would it? be links to it from Netflix.com. <sighs> like hey, still want DVDs? Click here. Anyway, the thing is, a lot of people got confused. They thought there were two things that Netflix did. They did a price hike, and then a little while after that, they did they were they were gonna do the split. So people thought that the price hike and the split were the same thing. That's not true. The price hike hap was announced before the split was announced, and the price hike isn't going anywhere. And the split was actually going to keep the same price. It was just going to give you two separate bills from two separate companies that would have added up to be the same price as what you're going to pay now anyway. Well, I guess my point is that the, the fact that they named it Quickster, I just I think that 
You're obsessed with his name, and I'm pretty because sure... Because it's the worst name. I... Names don't matter. People have changed names of things. Phoenix changed to Firebird, which changed to Firefox. Names... Scott, Everyone goes crazy when names are stupid or oh, names Scott, change, and it never means anything. Majority Give me one example of a stupid name or a name change that caused the company any problem whatsoever. Zima. No one drank Zima. No one drank Zima, not because of the name. It wasn't Possibly. The na- and it wasn't a name change or anything It was like- a new name. This wasn't a name change. This was a new company called... Napster, I mean Whatever. Quickster. People just didn't like Quickster because they didn't want to have two separate fucking accounts. They wanted to keep just the one to keep it simple. And most people don't even want the DVDs. They just want streaming, but the majority of things you want to watch are not in the streaming because is, content... That's why I keep one DVD. Yeah, the thing is... And as soon as I finish IMDb Top 250, I'm probably going to cancel the whole thing. Well, I remember... Let's go back because something similar happened a long time ago when Netflix dropped the multiple queues per account. Did they bring that back or not? I'm pretty sure they brought it back, but here's I'm pretty sure they didn't. I'm. I will bet you ten bucks that they did. Let me go look. I'm. I'm gonna have to sign into my Netflix now because. So here's the deal. Back then, they said, you know what? One day you can't have multiple queues in your account anymore, which really we talked about this on Geek Nights when it happened. But it really messed a lot of people like me up because you know I have a queue for like TV shows that are serial. We're like I don't want two DVDs of this show at the same time. I want to send back the DVD I just finished and get the next DVD of a show. Independent of that, I want all my movies in another queue. That way, if I watch a movie and I send it back, I get another movie. I don't get the next DVD of the show that I don't need. Yep. And they got rid of that. And I said, Fuck Or if you, you have that- five people in your house and you're crazy and you pay for five discs, you want to have one account with one bill and you want to get five separate discs and five separate queues. Yep. Or you've got kids, you give them one DVD and their own queue so you don't have to deal with it. Okay, I'm I'm logged into my Netflix and I ha- it says your queue and I can't find any way to get another queue. I'm pretty sure they announced that they were bringing it back. I don't see any way to get it. I will in- try to look it up. But regardless, so what happened was... They uh, they did this, and I said, fuck you, and I went down to one DVD, because I'm like, if I can't have multiple queues, I only need one DVD. And then I realized that even if I could have queues back, which I don't know if I ever did get it back, and here's why there's confusion on that point, I only needed one DVD. I didn't watch enough Netflix for it to matter. Okay, so they didn't add multiple queues, but I can add profiles. Same thing. Which mean, but it's like a whole separate account. But Scott, it was always that way. And those separate accounts can't watch instantly. Yeah, it was always that way. Mm-hmm. Only there was no instantly back then. Anyway, maybe there was, but it sucked. But uh, yeah, the DVD, I don't, the whole DVD rental online model needs to go away. It's pointless to have the ability to rent DVDs in this fashion of the modern era. I don't think so. No, it's the only reason it's not pointless is because not everything is available for streaming. Well, that's yeah. Everything was on the fucking stream. It's streaming. pointless in the high level sense because there's no reason anything that is available on DVD can't be available for streaming. And you can't tell me that it's because it takes too much space because space is infinite. And you can't tell me it's because it'll take too much bandwidth. It's just because the content is they're trying to do it legally. Someone should just start an illegal Netflix just the way Crunchyroll was illegal originally. Just put every fucking movie on there. And just be like, yeah, what? 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 Where are what? you going to host this? Some other country. What, what country? Somalia? Fucking, I don't know, Pirate Bay. All right. You're going to get enough bandwidth for millions of people well, to in, stream? It's in Sweden, so actually there's plenty of bandwidth. Nah. <laughs> but the problem is that the, the people who own the copyrights to things basically refuse to play ball with the modern media world. And I don't still don't know why a big smart tech company doesn't just buy all the fucking movies well, straight movies, up. Movies might be a little it's harder. Like, but look at it. It's like ne- Netflix. Yeah, but it's like Netflix is like buying the rights to movies to, to put them streaming. You know, it's making deals. It's like, don't make a deal. Just buy their entire fucking collection. Right. It's like if I it's uh, remember how I, I asked uh, the wedding uh, photographer at, at Scott's wedding about, yep. you know, and he basically lied to me because if you go to his website to look at the photos, they all have these watermarks on them. And he has a JavaScript to prevent you from context clicking. Yeah. And the, and the he image- told me differently. He said, yeah, you can do whatever you want with them as long as you're not like selling merchant, you know. But he was lying. Oh, of course. Wedding photographers always lie. I could have told Scojo that. I didn't believe that guy for a second. Yeah, I was very skeptical. But anyway, but at least I asked him, and at least he answered me instead of just copping out. But, but he, he lied. He lied. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the point is, it's like if I'm going to pay a photographer to photogra- photograph an event at some point, right, 
I'm going to just buy, you know, I'm not going to be like, I will buy the prints from you. It's like, no, you're going to give me the copyright to all the photos in writing, you know? So it's like, Netflix, don't pay people to let you stream movies. Buy the copyrights to uh, all the goddamn movies. Scott, either they're not for sale, the company just won't sell it to you, or they ask too much money. You, and if it's a public company, it's for sale. No. That's what public also, means. Scott, it means for sale. Uh, yeah, so you have enough money to just buy it out? Netflix was $300 a share before they fucked up. Even then, that doesn't mean they have that much cash. Uh, well, I don't think you know how stock works. <laughs> I'm just saying. Google maybe could do you it. You don't have to buy all the movies. You can just buy some movies, and you start with some, and you can and get more later. And would you make enough money off of the fact that people don't pay you extra? In fact, they have all their subscribers anyway. All they have to do, their business model, from a game theory perspective, is to not lose subscribers and to gain more subscribers, independent of what content they offer. They have no incentive to add content unless it will add subscribers. But that's the thing. That's the number one reason that uh, subscribers leave is because the content's not. Do they the leave? Best. I don't think anyone leaves. People, I think Netflix. People have left. No, I don't think enough people have left to be people even. People have a left because they watch all the good movies and stuff, and then the, they don't have the newer seasons of the TV show, so they start pirating again. If they had I the TV shows Scott, the day they came out, Scott, people would stay Scott, with it. Scott, do you have any numbers to back that up? No, it's whatever that's what people say. Yeah, you know Twitter. what? People say the opposite, that everyone just keeps their accounts. But Netflix's subscriber numbers did go down. I read a thing. Yeah, but the thing is, they go they went down during the profile business back in the day, too. They, any company's subscriptions go down anytime anything changes. Mm. Anyway, we've gone a lot long, too, too, well, too long about this. Yeah, but they basically capitulated and said, all right, we'll have DVDs. I think... You should be legally justified. If you own a DVD of some media, I'm free to lend it to someone, right? Mm -hmm. I should be free, in my opinion, to transfer that to a digital form or have a fucking drive with the DVD in it. And if anyone wants to borrow it, I can lend it to them, but I can only lend it to one person at a time or N people based on the number of DVDs. Mm -hmm. I believe that Netflix should be able to, if they own you know, a hundred DVDs of some movie, independent of what the guy who made the movie or the guy who owns the copyright of the movie wants, they should be able to let up to a hundred people stream that movie at the same time. Yeah, why not? Well, probably lawsuits and bullshit. Well, no, there was a similar thing where Cablevision wanted to, instead of giving people DVRs, they wanted to have one DVR that recorded all the shows at the Cablevision headquarters and then to stream the show to you when you wanted to watch it on demand. Basically and I think making that should be fine. And I think they won when they tried to get that one over. I don't know. This, you it was brought pretty, that one up. The onus is on you. Anyway. I, onus. But I don't think they did it. It's, onus, know, Charles. Something weird happened, but they should have. They should have They should have just done it no matter what the court said. People have no balls. So anyway. Anyway, I guess we should say something about Steve Jobs, even though you know, it's sad. the internet has said too much. Well, I mean, a person died. It is sad. He yep. changed the world in many ways. He, he but was, he was also person. bad in many ways. But he was like, good in more ways than he was bad. Like all peoples. Mm. Are there any peoples who are all bad or all good? Maybe Hitler? He made paintings, which weren't... Apparently they weren't that good. They weren't good, but they didn't hurt anybody. How do you <laughs> know? Maybe they were so bad that they drove him crazy. They couldn't have been as bad as like fan fiction paintings you see. <laughs> they weren't furry paintings. The saucy ones, maybe? Right. They weren't saucy furry paintings. Maybe they were. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and uh, I guess when he was a baby, he wasn't bad, right? Maybe he cried a lot and everyone hated him. Maybe he, he might have been horrible. We don't know. <laughs> but, a lot of babies are horrible. And there's nobody who's all good. Not even like Gandhi. So, well, especially not Gandhi. But, you know, Steve Jobs. He was, he was Steve Jobs. If he would have not had fake medicine, he'd probably still be alive. Thing is, Apple will probably be fine. Probably. In fact, if anything... I have a feeling that the culture he instilled will live on, but the company might open up a little bit. I hope it opens up. The only major change I've seen so far since, and it happened before he died, but after he left the company, was they started doing a charity thing to where like Apple employees can have their paychecks go to charity, you know, portion, whatever. Every big company does that, though. Apple didn't do it. Really? That, that That's kind of sad. Steve Jobs was... It, people are, you know, people don't know because, you know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett are very open with the charity. They're like, give all the fucking money away, bitches. Steve Jobs was either of like the Jewish mentality where you give, but you don't tell anyone that you gave because that would be, you know, because it's like it's not charity if you're t letting everyone know because then you're like, I'm so charitable and great. Look at but me. But Scott, if good is done for a bad reason, good is still done. Yes, of course. But I'm just saying, is it, you know, it is it, it's. 
it, your motives are not pure if you're gloating about the goodness that you do. I would argue that no one's motives are pure because dopamine. Of course not. But the point is, is that there are there's people aren't sure if either he di- he was very giving but kept it anonymous, or was he just really not fucking giving? Well, there is one problem with having the company that does this sort of thing. People feel pressured to donate some amount of their paycheck. Yeah, okay. Well, the company matches, though, so why wouldn't, you know? You could just have it donate to something that's going to go to you. For example, a good strategy? ACLU. Well, yeah, but I mean, give to a charity that is a scholarship that might be won by one of your kids. You know what I'll give to? Yep. The human fund. Human fund. <laughs> <laughs> Best fund. All right. All right. So Steve Jobs, we just said it because I guess obligatory. Not yeah, the, <laughs> uh, nothing I'm going to say now will not have already been said. The by whole internet else. already said whatever. Okay, so Google, uh it was recently they were there was some rumblings that they were come up with a new language, not Go, which they already came out with, but another one. Stop. Called Dart. Uh, and now they actually came out with it. You can go to dartlang.org to read about it. And basically, they're trying to replace JavaScript, which is Hooray! hallelujah. But of course, they you know they can get it put into Chrome, which is rapidly gaining share, which is helpful. But how are you going to get anyone to write their website in Dart unless Safari and Firefox and IE all support it? And that's going to take at least you know IE's probably if they're going to add it, aren't going to add it until like IE eleven or twelve, right? And Firefox probably won't add it. You know, it's like so. Good luck with that. But it can compile down to JavaScript, sort of like CoffeeScript. So who knows? Uh, but it's actually it's a pretty interesting language. Like it sort of looks like Java, but it can be strictly typed or not typed. It's sort of it's sort of weird. Uh, but I don't actually know much about it. As long as it's better than JavaScript, I'll be happy. Right now, it's just sort of in development. Uh, but it's object oriented as opposed to the functional JavaScript, which is good for a lot of people who mostly understand object oriented programming. Uh, it's got a little bit of that jQuery ness where you use you know the CSS selectors to grab objects from the from the DOM, and it's got interfaces. So l- just like in Java, where you implement interfaces, that's how this works. You just implement interfaces all over the fuck. Uh huh. So uh, we'll see how this goes. I might, I'm gonna try it out. Yeah, I'm I'm interested, but actually I write very little code these just days. Just because I hate JavaScript. Yeah. And who doesn't? Uh, people who only know JavaScript. But they probably hate it anyway. You probably, you know, you should. So, very briefly, Amazon, there's this whole problem with sales tax, and every state has its own rules. It's really hard to follow all of them, and whether or not you have to pay sales tax, and the fact that all of you out there probably owe and do not pay fully your use taxes. Yep. Like in New York, if I buy a car, like when I moved to New York from Michigan, I had a car. I had to prove to New York State that I paid sales tax on it, and then I had to pay a use tax because I bought it out of state and brought it into New York. Mm-hmm. But all that aside, uh, Tennessee is working with Amazon. And there's an idea coming out of this that I think is really interesting that I think won't happen, even though I think it really needs to happen. I don't think we states should have any right to tax internet sales. And I think there should be a separate federal internet sales tax. Well, of course. I mean, this is the, something I haven't understood for the longest time is, you know, states trying to regulate the internet in any way whatsoever. Well, they, Scott, because states regulate commerce internally. So if I form sure. a company, for example, I have to form it in a state and That's be bound true. by that state's laws. So what they say is you form this company in New York you got to follow all New York's rules, which includes collecting sales tax for New Yorkers. Right, but the point is, is that, you know, the company is a New York company. I am physically in New York, but the business we are conducting is on the internet. There is a Well, ex- now you could argue, where's the server? It does, so fine, is the server in the same fucking state? It's in New York. Is there any traffic routed to any other state whatsoever, or any other country, if, as, as any part of that transaction? Uh, Scott, if I buy something in New York... Drive out of New York, turn around, drive back in. That does not change the status. It should. Why? Because the internet is not. Uh, it is like big. The internet is bigger than the United States. It should actually count as like international commerce. Even if I buy something from Amazon and they're a U.S. company and I'm in the U.S. Regardless, I there's this whole deal Amazon's making with Tennessee, but it's not that interesting. But I really, honestly think that. No state should be allowed to collect any sales tax on any online transaction. We should have a federal tax. And at best, all the taxes that go to the Fed for that, you know, 5%, 6%, whatever, Mm -hmm. should be allocated back to the states 
based on, I don't know, the Fed could just calculate it based on whatever state gave the most in, gets the most out or something. Something like that. I mean, think about this, right? Even though there are radio towers within states, right, that might be broadcasting from a state to the same state, the FCC regulates that shit because the airwaves is federal territory. So are the phone lines. So should be the internet. Well, most mm. of the laws, from what I can gather, I'm not a lawyer, related to sales tax on the internet are the laws that were used to regulate mail order catalogs and it phone is, catalogs. Well, that is pretty similar. It is, actually. But the scale of commerce is on such a different Except plane. For, but the thing is, even mail order catalogs, right? You're using the mail, which is a federal thing. Therefore, my, even the, I'm, I'm sort of doing interstate commerce because my mail is entering the post office, which is federal territory. So the mail goes into federal territory, which is not a, a state in itself, but is no state. So it goes to no state and then comes back to same state that it left from. But it uh, still left the state and came back in. I'm pretty sure that doesn't matter. I know, it, obviously, it doesn't matter. But you know what? I would change that if I could. I'm just, you know, as much as I would love, you know, my smarter state that I live in now to be able to do its own thing, I'm kind of sick of states all having their own slightly crooked rules about pointless crap. Well, this is the only reason Amazon is complaining is they don't actually care about collecting the tax. No. They just care about it so ridiculously complicated for them to actually get all the tax rules right in their system that they would have to have like an army of people and lawyers constantly updating all these incredibly tiny rules. And when you click checkout, this ridiculous database would look, it would probably be slow as molasses when you click checkout to look up and calculate the exact right sales tax that you have to pay. Right, so that they're not over or undercharging anyone. That you know, and they got to go by your address and where you are, and it would it wouldn't be exact one hundred percent precise because they, they don't even have the data for that. Right, it's like you put in your address, so they try to find you on the map, but if the map's slightly off, you might be in a different tax zone. Now you can argue, be, you can argue, Scott, that Amazon's big enough; they should have to, you know, companies. It's impossible. No, it's not impossible. It's just really expensive. Companies, it's impossible. There are databases for stuff like this, kind of like what we're going to talk about in a little bit, <laughs> and. People can deal with this on a large scale. It just costs money. You could say it's a cost of doing business, just like how if I have a brick factory, I have to pay the cost of de you know following all the environmental regulations. It's, it's, you can get it really, you can get it very close to right. It's impossible to get it 100 percent right. Well, that's especially separate, Scott, when there's things Scott, like five that, day tax holiday in. Fuck, Scott, Bumblefuck, that is a separate problem of the fact that our legal system, and particularly our tax laws, are just. 100, 200, 300 year old clusterfucks. Yeah. But all that aside, you could argue that Amazon should have to bear that cost of operating. <laughs> that cost for Amazon would not be that bad. The cost for like Joey Jojo selling his Etsy stuff? Yeah. Impossible. Yeah. It, it, regulations like that, because they're so Byzantine, destroy small businesses. But even if they could do it, right? Where would you even get the data? If, if say, There's databases. Right, but e let's say some tiny county has a three-day tax holiday. There's databases. Even, so you, you're telling me that tiny county with 10 farmers in it is going to update that database for those 10 days they have a tax holiday. Most of the civilized so states do, as far as I can tell. Even I found, for the, even for the I bumblefuck found some databases of this information, but they're all very expensive. Yeah. Anyway. But anyway, things of the day. So this is a pretty great video. Scott showed it to me. It's a couple minutes long, like four or five. And uh, it's a scientist pointing out that dopamine levels go up to reward you when you do stuff. But no it turns kidding. out that they go up more in anticipation of getting rewarded for doing stuff right. than the, they do the dopamine, for actually getting rewarded. The dopamine actually comes out before you get the reward while you're while you're anticipating the reward, not so I push after the button, you get the reward. So it's I push the button, I get a reward. I push the button, I get a little bit of dopamine, I get a reward. I push the button, I get a little more dopamine, I get the reward. And then it gets to the point to where I get like the, the reward is from anticipating the reward. You get the, the dopamine is squirted into your brain before you push the button, pretty much. Basically. Not after you push the button. And then you definitely don't get anything when you get the reward, right. as far as I can and tell. And on top of that, right, is let's say there's a button that you push, and only half the time you push the button, the reward comes out. You're not so, guaranteed to get the reward. So what do you think is going to happen? Are we going to have more or less dopamine? You get a zillion times more dopamine. If, like double. And you still get it before you push the button, but you get more when it, there's only a chance of the reward happening. So it's like scratch-off lottery tickets give you way more than, say, lottery tickets where you're guaranteed to win, or candy bars, which you're guaranteed to eat. 
<laughs> so I'm just going to make a Farmville, which is, you know, or half a, the time you click and nothing happens. Yeah, a game just like that, only sometimes your farm doesn't get better. You have to come back every hour. You can click again. And sometimes when you click, your farm gets better. And sometimes when you click, your farm doesn't get better. It just, whatever, you know, it won't be a farm. It'll be something else, you know. Could be like that, uh, the money tree. Remember that tree? That big I clicked gift? on that tree so many times in high school. Yeah, I went in high school. I went but to that during, tree. During the school day. Obviously, I wasn't wasting my time at home. But I went and clicked around for a while, and I was like, wait a minute. There's no money in here. And I stopped doing it. <laughs> we but did I, it did anyway, have, I did have a computer, 486, that ran this bar on the bottom that showed ads and paid you like a penny an hour. And I had a thing that moved the mouse back and forth. Uh, I never got paid, though, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, so check this out. For me? This isn't the greatest, but the internet hasn't been that great lately. In fact, your thing of the day I gave to you, so I took this one for myself because you didn't want it. Yeah, my policy is only things of the day that I can show to someone on an HTPC. I can show this to someone on HTPC. It's a YouTube video called Pac-Man the Musical. It's just a cute little claymation Pac-Man with a little song, and that's it. It's okay. It's pretty cute. It's okay. It's not the greatest, but, you know, internet's slow lately. That was the best thing you've seen in the last 24 hours. My theory is that all the internet, the best people who make the best internet stuff yeah. are, are all occupying Wall Street. <laughs> 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 all the crazy people. So very briefly, in the meta moment, the book club book was The Ear of the Eye of the Arm by Nancy Farmer. Well, the, did, we, did we put that up yet? Not yet, but it's done. The episode will go up whenever I put it up. All right. And the uh, next book club book, the current book club book is... You forgot, didn't you? No, it's your book. You get to say it. Uh, I, what is it then? The was, Little I, Prince. And? And uh, what's the other book that he wrote? The, you, the one, the, I, so I was right. You forgot it. I forgot the name of the book. Yeah, it's called Wind, Sand, and Stars by Antoine de saint Juperi. And I'm waiting for a French person to tell me I'm saying his name wrong. <laughs> we will be at the New York Comic Con, but not doing panels, just hanging out. Uh, if you want to see what panels we would have done, come to some other anime con, like Anime Boston. Uh, MAGFest is shaping up. We're part of the MAG9, though I think there's more than nine people now, gaming intellectuals. And Burning Apocalypse Con, 11-11-11. Yep. So a month we, from now. We will be there. All right. Doing stuff. Yep. So, uh, there are a surprising number of databases, or just large collections of factual information, that are very, very important to the way computers, technology, the world work, and yet, not only do like non-technologists not care about it, but most technologists don't care about it or even think about it or know it's a problem. Well, because these are things, you know, it's sort of like I was reading today about uh, the problem of the uh, the shrinking kilogram, right? How, like, it's losing, it lost, like, a fraction of weight and how they're trying desperately to, to get rid of the kilogram and instead base it on something else. And, like, well, kind of like how we made a second be defined by, you know, right. cesium, whatever. So, it, like, one guy, instead of trying to define a kilogram based on the weight of, like, what's it called, like, the K well, something? Well, the mass of Right, the, the mass of, what's it called, the something K. But anyway, instead of you basing it on that particular object that's stored in a vault in Paris, right? Which I point out, we can't actually be basing it on that if we recognize that it is fact it has in fact changed. Actually, no, we are because there is a uh, go read about the, how it works, but they have these other ones next to it and all this stuff. But uh, one guy is trying to base it on Avogadro's number. He's ba basically what they're trying to do. Do you is remember Avogadro's number? Nine point oh two times ten to the twenty. Uh -huh. Six? Close enough. Right. But they're trying but they need it to be a cert they need to basically calculate Avogadro's number to more decimal places than it currently is. They need eight decimal places of hundred percent certainty basically to get it to be have it be good enough. Six point oh two two. So what they're trying to do Times ten to the twenty third is they're trying to fashion a sphere of silicon, right? That's that's exactly that they know exactly how many atoms are in there, and then you base it on that because then they'll know, aha, the mass of nine point oh two times you know, this many, right? Uh, 6.022. Another guy. Times 10 to the 23rd. Right. Anyway. You keep saying nine. I don't know why I say that. <laughs> it is 6.022 times 10. Any oh, I had the six and whatever. Uh, there's another guy who's trying. Wait, wait, wait. You had the six and what? Well, I had the six in the wrong place. Okay. I, had, I had a nine that came out of nowhere. Because you said I had the six and. Well, never mind. I'm like, what do you mean you had the six? <laughs> like, where was the six? Where'd it go? Well, I said 9.02 times 10 to the 26, even though my brain was thinking maybe it's third. And well, then I was like, no, it's 6.02 times 10 to, right? I had this, I put the six where the three should be. Yeah, I'm, you see, I, I can't make fun nine. of you because my brain 
you know, if you go back in time, Rim in uh, like chemistry class when I was at the community college in high school is looking at Rim today being, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> Come on, dude. Right. So <laughs> one other guy's trying to do it where he's he basically put a kilogram mass on a giant scale in his ha- in, a, in a building and he's going to pull down the other end of the scale. Right. With an electromagnet. And then he's going to figure out exactly so precisely how many you know, volts or watts or whatever are, uh, of electricity you have to put into that electromagnet to get the thing to be perfectly balanced. And then he can be like, aha, so a kilogram is the mass that you can pull with exactly this many volts of electricity, to me- right? So th- those two guys are trying to figure out you know, a better way of measuring the kilogram. But anyway... Now, that one's not so relevant to computer technologists. No, but the point yet. is, is that information, right? That fundamental base of... How much is a kilogram, right, underlies all this science. But if you're like a biologist, you know, kilograms are important to biologists, but they're not thinking about the weights and measures all the time. In fact, they're probably not thinking about it even on an annual basis unless an article about it shows up, right? They're just, they got the scales in their lab and the scales, you know, they they calibrate them and it's a kilogram. Good. You know, they're not basing their scales on the real kilogram, right? But somewhere along the line... Deep down, the person who made the scale and the person, they have a thing that they use to calibrate, and that thing was based on something which is eventually was based on the real deal. And in the world of computers, there are a whole bunch of servers out there that are way down at the bottom, just like the real kilogram is way down at the bottom, and all of the other computers are based on that, sort of like the root 13 DNS servers. You're hardly ever talking to them. Your computer basically never talks to those servers. Well... Window old Windows computers constantly talk to them, but right. that's a separate. But problem. it's extremely rare. It is possible, you know, it happens once in a while. But it's extremely yep. rare that your computer ever contacts those computers. Now let, let's zoom back a little bit, because you know, Pete, you all know how DNS works on some level, but you probably don't actually know how like bind works or the difference between a recursive query and all the different ways DNS functions and the you know the the pointer records, the in adder yep. ARPA and all that stuff. But think about it on a high level. All right, you want to look something up. You say, oh, well, I go to the comm server. How do I know where comm is? How do I know what server manages comm? Mm -hmm. How do I know what server manages net? Because there's a text file on your computer that says what. Yep, so where's that text file come from? (laughs) Someone wrote it. Yep, and... By hand. Yep. And when you like when you bootstrap a Linux computer from default and you like like from scratch and you set up like the base base stuff in your system, one of the things you do is you get your like seed file for your DNS and it uses that to well, find Well, if you everything. install bind, it comes with the text file. Yeah, but that seed file comes from somewhere. Yes, yeah, so the guy it's in the bind source code repository. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so Basically, there's these bunch of servers providing all kinds of services way down at the bottom of all technology, right, that you hardly ever talk to or notice, but there's often drama around them. Yep. Great drama. Like, there was a point where I think two or three of the root DNS servers got hacked and went down And they were in, some of them were in weird countries where shit can happen. And there's only 13 of them. There can't be more. Yep. Uh, also, what you'll often have is the typical cloud situation, right? It's like the cloud is great because if something's in the cloud, it's on the internet, you can access it from anywhere, but it also is a single point of failure. So it's like there'll be the server that provides some service that everyone needs, and then it goes down. Uh oh, it went down. Or never mind, look at the fact that you know people think, oh, the internet's just a big web. It's actually not that web like at all. And well, it's- I mean, it, it, it could be more web like. It, it you know architecturally it could, it could and be. should be it isn't there's, due not, to there's a nothing lot technological stopping us from doing it it's mostly stuff that is you know uh i guess organizational that is stopping us from doing it yeah but there are you know you think you have an isp but there's isps for isps and there is drama the likes of which you will never fathom between those isps oh god on a regular basis sometimes you try to go to like part of the like a website's down you're like oh the internet like there's some problem that has sometimes been caused by pissing matches between two chunks of the internet who say, we're not going to route to you anymore. Yeah, think about it, right? So you get, let's say you live somewhere and there's like four ISPs, right? Well, you know, there might be only one undersea cable between country A and country B. So no matter who your ISP is, if the person who runs the servers on the ends of the international underwater cable has a pissing match, uh, suddenly the whole internet 
in that country looks like it's down and you're they look like your country is down so you'll try to go to www.co that other country and nothing will come up to any of the sites you're like what's going on here and they'll think the same thing about you but really it's just a pissing match between two dicks so this has happened yet again there's a new story that has come to light something very that's why we thought of doing this episode yep and uh I know who the smart techies are, the ones who are on, not, I don't want to say our level, but the ones who think about stuff the way we do, because all of them emailed me and said, oh my God, Rim, this will piss you off. And I'm like, one step ahead of you, home <laughs> song. <laughs> well, I was the one, I sent it to you first, because I'm, I'm, I actually know, the, I am best internet. The uh, administrator in my office sent it to me long before you did. Whoa. <laughs> anyway. I had not read Slashdot yet that day. Uh-huh. So you want to talk about it? All right, let's talk about it. So time zones, right? Yep. Time zones just work in computers. I mean, I make a Linux computer, and it just has this list of time zones like New York, USA. Yeah, you look at your cell phone, and it if you travel somewhere, when you get off the plane, the time zone just magically changes. It knows where it is. It knows the difference between wherever you are and whatever time it is, UTC, and it changes the clock. Oh, look, I just, in my Windows computer, if I want to pick UTC, I have to choose between Monrovia, Rick. I'm not going to say that word. Dublin, Edinburgh, Lisbon, London, CUT, or Casablanca. Or GMT. Or Is U GMT even listed? No, just UTC. Oh, really? You can't pick Greenwich? Okay, whatever. It doesn't say Greenwich. Yeah. GMT and UTC are not 100% exactly the same thing, but they're the same time. Oh, I can pick Effect Caracas or Santiago. Effectively. Anyway, and not just that. Like, you might think, all right, maybe I could do it manually. Like, all right. I put in minus five because that's, you know, I'm there. Except if you pick minus five, when the time changes because of daylight savings, you got to switch it to minus four. Yeah, and what then if you got to switch it back to minus five. And what if you're in Indiana? What if you go to Indiana? And it's not just a matter of, you know, what date. You know, it's like, you know, people are used to just waking up at like 8 a.m. and changing their time back. You know, it doesn't matter if you do it right away. And for displaying dates to human beings, it doesn't matter right away. But for computers, computer needs to have the time change at the exact millisecond that the time changes. If the daylight savings time changes at midnight on October something, I don't even know what date it's supposed to be. They need to happen that second. The clock has to go bloop and go back an hour immediately. Now, this information, I mean, who has this information? It's countries can kind of do what they want. So in the U.S., it doesn't matter. We don't change around our time zones very often. And in most of the but you need to know what world, day the daylight savings time flips. Yeah, which every didn't year. change forever until recently we were stupid and right. moved stuff around. But again. also, there's some funky ass states that are like split in the middle, and there's some other states that like do different things, and it's weird. Yeah, but I think so I just wait, wait, I just want to say in terms of time zones, you know, talking about time zones specifically, sort of off topic, but the point is, I think what we should all do is the entire world should just use 24-hour UTC clocks. There should be no time zones, and wherever you live, you just get used to it. If you're waking up at 13 and going to bed at 24, and meanwhile, in another time zone, people get up at 7 and go to bed at some, you know, then just get used to whatever your number happens to be where you live, and that should be it. I'm entirely ambivalent because while I see the merits of your proposal, mm -hmm. I also see the useful normalization of being able to say 7 p.m., and that means evening to everyone in their context. Yeah, but how useful it would be to be like, we're going to have this, uh, you know, we're going to record this podcast at 13. And just everyone knows, oh, oh, oh 13. Oh. I, I definitely see the use in it. For example, anytime someone says, you know, some of our listeners live on that other coast. I don't know why, but they occasionally will say, hey, we're going to play a game of Counter-Strike at 4 o'clock PST. And my answer is to ignore all things that are at any time other than Eastern. Right. It would be so much easier if we just said, hey, we're going to do it at 14. And everyone just did. And no one even had to think about time zones ever. No? Huh? Well, think about the weird problems you can have. Like, say, all right, my computer just jumps forward and falls back. What if I'm writing log files? All right, jumping forward's fine. I jump forward. There's just an hour gap in my logs once a year. Falling back, something happened at, you know, 1.45 a.m., Something happened at 1.45 a.m. Which one's which? Yeah, did this actually happen at the same time as that other thing or an hour later? So what do you... I of mean, course, it, the log file usually writes in order. So what you're going to see is you're going to see 11.59, then 11. So ah, but what if it's a log file that's machine read that's based on timestamps This or is something? why you always have your log files writing in UTC. <laughs> yeah, but even that... So what if, for example... You know, we don't want to talk about the tech stuff. No. Let's talk about the real story Talk here. about the, the story. So... uh. 
this database. You know, you have to maintain this. What's this what is it called? Like somewhere. the Olsen something? I forget. It's I, called I, something. I, I vague. I barely knew about it to be honest. This shows that even we don't pay attention that much until there's a problem. But it is. It's the Olsen TZ database. So countries can change. There's stuff. I mean, what if some country is like, oh, I'm changing X. Someone's got to collect all that information and put it somewhere. And you can't trust private companies to just do that because they'll probably try to charge money for the database, try to license it out, some sort of bullshit shenanigans. On the web and the mailing list for this whole thing, a post was made four days, eight hours and 23 minutes ago. Quote, a civil suit was filed on September 30th in federal court in Boston. I'm the defendant. The case involves the time zone database. The FTP server at lc.nci.nih.gov has been shut down. The mailing list will be shut down after this message. Electronic mail can be sent to me at arthurdavidolson at gmail.com. I like how this super GNU Linux sounding guy uses Gmail. That mm. says a lot, actually. Yep. I hope there will be better news shortly. Otto. And that innocuous letter made... Thousands of nerds around the world start screaming, fuck! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was just actually, today, I had to write a program that used the time zone data, and I used the Python TZ data module, and it yep. worked, even though this database is down. But if some change happens, you won't be up to date. That's true, I'll be fucked. Yeah, which actually is fine for most of the industrialized world in the short term. Very short term. Now, the story, as far as I can tell, is that this private company is suing them. Right, so here's the story as it is on Wikipedia, which is as trustworthy All right, as Wikipedia well, is. You tell it the Wikipedia way, and I have this other article, and okay. we'll see if there's any disparity. There's a lawsuit, a lawsuit between Astrolabe Incorporated versus Olsen et al. It was filed concerning copyright of the database, right? So the database's maintenance and dissemination operations are shut down. The, u the case revolves around the use by the database maintainers of the atlases, the American Atlas by Thomas G. Shanks and the International Atlas by Thomas G. Shanks and Rick Pottinger. It specifically complains of unauthorized reproduction of the atlases' data in the time zone mailing list archive and some auxiliary link collections maintained with, it with the database, but doesn't actually point at the database itself. The complaint relates only to the compilation of historical time zone data and does not cover time zone data world time zone tables. The Atlas is one of the favored sources for the database, and so the database includes much factual data that has been copied from it. Now, there are many ways to look at this. On one hand, it takes effort to gather facts. It does. So maybe we have a vested interest in protecting the intellectual property rights of people who gather facts so that they will right. continue to gather facts if for a us. Fact, fact gathering is incredibly useful, even though, say, an almanac would only collect you know, publicly available information and publish it in a compact format, it takes work to produce that. So, so that work maybe you want should be protected. And it is a useful service, so we want people... <laughs> You know, it don't necessarily needs to be intellectual property, but there needs to be well, some... Well, it is intellectual property. It just doesn't well, it necessarily is, need to be the current copyright regimen we have. I'm just saying there needs to be some way to... You know, we want to encourage and com and perhaps compensate those people by a means. It may not be an intellectual property means, but some means, probably a good idea. But simultaneously... We want people to collect facts in useful ways. We have a vested interest as a society to make factual information readily available with zero licensing concerns of any kind. Right. I should not have to pay anyone any amount of money to know what the time zone is anywhere ever in the history of the world or the future. Let that, alone that what needs the, to be publicly available and free information for all people. Now, let alone what the time zone was 24.67 years ago. Which also needs to be publicly available and for free for everyone forever. That's the kind of thing that should be in a history book. Exactly. Now, the, now the, the nuance well, of in copyright Atlas. law gets down to the weird stuff of like, say, like if I read, a, if I have a history book that talks about Peter the Great doing something and I copy that text verbatim, I'm committing copyright violations. Mm-hmm. But if I just take the facts from that book and republish them on my own, I'm not actually sure what the specific line is where someone can go after you. Yeah, as long as you got a bibliography going on, right? I mean, you, that's all you did in school, right? Is that you? They would say, read books and don't plagiarize. But you still had to get the facts from the books and you would cite them. And then that was considered okay. I think there was... I turned in the same essay to five different professors at RIT. Right. And in my bibliography, I cited myself... 
giving it for another class, but I obfuscated it and no one noticed. But had they called me on it, I did not actually violate any of the policies of the school. Yeah. Anyway. But that you know. essay really was kind of a great essay, too. <laughs> Uh yeah well I don't even remember what I was saying because your funny story. <laughs> In fact, I, one class I didn't do the real essay and I was gonna get like a C. So I was like, look, can I write a paper just for you on some other topic, like say this thing I already wrote an essay on that I've turned into four other professors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's good stuff. All right. So anyway, so basically, at what point do we eminent domain? factual information that has been collected even if someone put effort into collecting it but more importantly this company that's suing these people i can't really be on their side no because who is going to buy this data yeah it's sort of like you know even you know there's certain things i don't even think you know most people would say oh the u.s government should eminent domain it or something like that it's like no the world should eminent domain it. This needs to be f for everyone. It's not just one country, right? This data is important for the entire world. Nobody should be without this data. They should just have like some international law come down and be like, bam. There's no such thing as international law I in the know. sense that it's only there if countries are willing to enforce it. But there should be some, this is why we need some sort of internet to be its own country, right? She's like, bam, this data is now public for everyone. Here's some money, guys who collected it. Now it belongs to everybody. The end. And then, you Here, know, Scott, they'll the hire is, one guy to maintain it. The thing is, effectively, if the if that were to happen in the U.S., that effectively means that that happened for the world. For right. Most kinds of but data. it'd be better if it, if it was really for the world. Ah, but if it was truly international, we're still in dodgy territory as to, you know, international organizations still have to have people in places. Yeah, that's why we need to fix that flakiness. Moon? Moon. Maybe Moon's Antarctica. Antarctica. Space station. Maybe we need a Washington D.C. equivalent of the internet. We need actually, internet land. you know, satellite wouldn't be a bad idea. We could just take all the important datas and put them in a satellite, and you know, like a, a homemade satellite. That'll have great throughput and incredibly low latency. But it doesn't need to be hit that often. We just need to keep it somewhere. It's like great, you won your lawsuit against who? You can't sue me. Space. I'm, yeah, you space lawsuit. <laughs> no, you Good know what? Job, you win. Guys. You win. I hereby award you ten million space dollars. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a penny, but I need change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now it is worth noting that Microsoft, Windows, and probably, presumably at least, many of the cell phone providers that they might be using their own files because Microsoft, according to this guy, I'm looking at his website has their own time zone data files that they get from some other source. Yeah, but I can't use those Microsoft ones in, say, my own personal app, can I? I don't know. I could probably, if I'm writing a Windows app, there's probably API calls to access that data, but they probably, you know, I can't just take that out of Windows and start using it in my Linux app or my iPhone app. I need something more general and free, like the Python, T Python TZ data module, which I use today. Yep. Yeah. But anyway, it's not, you know, we this came up because of the time zone issue with this particular server going down, but there's actually a whole bunch of things just like this that are either more clear or less clear in terms of should the information be public and all that kind of thing. For example, maps, right? There's a lot of companies that make maps and cartography is hard. Yep. And so we need to reward these people. But, or at least, you know, there needs to be incentive for people to do cartography. But at the same time, knowing where shit is and knowing the shape of the earth and knowing, you know, that should not be secrets that people should have to pay for. If you need to know where something is, it doesn't matter where it but is. But I did see stories of people lobbying to shut down Google Maps in its early days on the grounds that having free maps that were that accessible. And I think the same thing happened with, uh, what was that site I used to use before Map Google? MapQuest. MapQuest. Yahoo Maps. Uh, no, Mi no Microsoft my also. Ha I think there's no a Bing one used Yahoo. Maps. I think there's a Bing Maps also. Until recently, actually, kind of an aside, uh, MapQuest used to have better driving directions, but now Google caught up. So well, because Google does everything based on data, so it just took long enough for their computers to learn. Whereas MapQuest was, you know, better to for, to start out with. Because they hired people to drive around. That too, but they also didn't. It didn't learn at the same rate as Google Maps. So Google Maps started out crappier, but caught up. The only time Google Maps kind of fails is when you're trying to drive through Manhattan. Anywhere around Manhattan, it like pulls you into Manhattan. It's like, don't go over the RFK. Go through a tunnel and drive through Manhattan. It'll be fine. <laughs> anyway. <sighs> but so what do we do there? I mean, 
should we just eminent domain all the maps people made? Well, I mean, do we have government workers making maps? There is actually an open map site. Uh, I forget what it's called. I think it's OpenStreetMap. And they get a bunch of maps from this, I think it's like a Tiger database, which is a database of open maps, but it's not 100%, right? But it's a lot of maps, but it's not all the maps. So what about uh, so That would Google be maps? like if there was a free government-ish time zone database that only had most of the time zones in it, but not so all of them. What about Google Maps, where it's free as in beer, pretty much. But it's not free as in speech. I mean, but these, at I can the same embed time, it, but I can't, you know. People, people embed Google Maps all the time. You can make your own maps and directions and everything. It's effectively free sort for of. most all intents and purposes. Not all the intent. There are certain, you know, if you want, obviously, for most things normal people are going to do, it covers it. But there are some weird things that you, a map person might want to do that you just can't do on Google Maps. Can you name one? I'm not a map expert, but I'm sure, you know, uh, there's something that someone might want to do it doesn't do. I was trying to find the uh, terms of service, and I actually couldn't find them quickly, so I'm just going to keep yeah, going. Yeah, regardless. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I don't have a good answer. I don't know what the yeah. best way to handle this is. Or how about even th- something like phone books or? Uh, well, phone books just need to disappear. Well, that too. But I mean, still a directory of phone numbers and names, right? Uh, think about it. Most people don't want there to be a directory of their phone number and name. It, it doesn't matter. It's it's. I actually had this idea this morning, right? What if? We Plus, st- the majority of people who know me couldn't look me up in the phone book because the name that would show up would not match any name they know. Right. I was thinking, what if we made a crowdsource database? And the way the crowdsource database works is you type in information about other people that you know. For example, you look across the street out your window at your neighbor's house. You know the address of your neighbor's so house. So you go to that address and you're like, one occupant, blonde hair, r- blue eyes, wears, maybe wears you, sweaters. Maybe you even know their name. You know what cars they have. You know what license plates that are on their cars. And you just start typing this stuff in. And just everyone starts doing it. And eventually, we have a database of everything that no one opted into. And there's nothing anyone could do about it's very, it. I had an idea. I wanted to do that just for the WTF moments. I wanted to make, like, whatthefuck.com, where you post locations and timestamps where something happened and try to get other people to give you data about what was going on in that area at that time. Right. It's like, it's always like, you know, there's this, uh, but publicly look at, here's available what would happen, Scott, a shit storm, because look at how many countries in the world and how many people are so mad that Google has the audacity to take free pictures of every street and put them online. <gasps> Gasp. So what would they do? They got to blur out the license plates too. I don't think they should. I don't think they should either. I don't think they should have to do any of that. Dumb. And you, you know, whatever. You want to make that website? You want to add that to the shit talk list? We'd get sued so fast. We get sued the fastest. Someone else make that website. I will put in so much data. <laughs> yeah. I might even invest in you, but I will not make it. Yeah, uh, whatever. But yeah, all these these databases of important information. We gotta we gotta do something about this. I don't know what government subsidy. I don't know what either. But you know what? You know, for something like time zones, like you can make a personal backup of that shit. But there are a lot bigger databases out there that you can't make a personal backup of. And there could be problems if something happens to them because like one country's a dick or something. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>